Um, so I'm just a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and um, I refer to my register of interests and uh, for the 10 years before uh, being elected I was um, a pensions specialist solicitor and I have to say to the Honourable Lady that for someone who claims to not be an expert I thought she uh, demonstrated a pretty incredible grasp of a lot of the key yeah. issues in a, a very good <laughs> opening speech which certainly put um, me to shame anyway. Um, I think uh, one of the points that is worth remembering, of course, is that when we talk about protecting DB schemes, the fiduciary duty on the part of trustees is to protect the benefits that have already built up. Their responsibility is to ensure that benefits that have been accrued can be paid. It's not their responsibility to ensure that an employer continues to provide ongoing DB provision, which is um, fundamentally um, an employment matter. And there will be many, many occasions when actually the best way of protecting DB benefits is to reduce future accrual to close the scheme or actually in the, the most nuclear options actually to tip the employer over into insolvency and have the scheme move over into the PPF. So I think we have to be a little bit careful about what we necessarily mean by protecting DB benefits and protecting DB schemes. But it absolutely goes without saying that the DB schemes do uh, face major challenges and I do think that through its green paper and then through its white paper the government has, has recognised that. Um, I wasn't sure when the Green Paper first came out that I agreed with the, the statement that DB schemes were, were largely unaffordable, simply just due to my own uh, caseload in the office at the time. But um, I do think that there is a, a point that generally the system works well for most employers, but that we do need a tougher approach for, for those failing to act responsibly. And I was pleased that actually a lot of the powers that the regulator sought were granted because one of my big frustrations in practice was that the regulator was largely completely toothless. They would send a lot of letters. They would have a lot of conference calls. If you were really unfortunate, you'd be dragged down to Brighton for an absolutely awful meeting where nothing really happened. So actually, the, the, the regulator is now going to... Yeah, absolutely. I am being not dragged, but voluntarily <laughs> going down to Brighton where the pensions regulator is uh, this Thursday uh, to actually have a proper five-hour sit-down with them, of which I will certainly be taking up some of the Honourable Lady's concerns. I think, Mr. Fadfish, I'm very pleased to hear that because actually the pensions regulator performs a vital role in its oversight of occupational pension schemes. And one of the big frustrations, particularly acting on the trustee side, but not usually when you're acting on the employer side, was the fact that the regulator didn't seem to have the time resources to really get stuck into the matter or to do anything serious to encourage or require an employer to change course. So I think uh, some of the improvements being suggested are, are very, very good. Um, in the past, pension schemes operated in a world of high interest rates and good equity returns. We obviously live in a very different world and the investment decisions do reflect ongoing uncertainty and volatility. And that has led to wide de uh, widespread de-risking with a preference for investing in bonds and gilts. And that's been a huge loss actually to the UK economy by taking that funding out of equities. And I do think we could do more um, to, to look at ways we can unlock some of the vast sums that sit behind pension schemes to boost... Well, um, yeah, absolutely. And it does matter for me to say my frustration quite often that actually sort of UK infrastructure, life loss UK infrastructure, owned by pension schemes overseas. And despite exhortations by the government for these schemes in order to basically to, to, to invest more in the UK and in these very stable and high-producing assets, they still seem quite reluctant to do so. Thank my honourable friend for that intervention. I agree com completely. I mean, there's a lot of big pension funds, I think it's Canadian pension schemes and oh, lots yeah. of others, um, invest a lot. And it's actually, um, these sort of investment projects are, are very good returns and we could be unlocking huge amounts of money to, to boost those in. In terms of final salary pension schemes, ultimately they're only going to end up in one of two places. They're either going to be successful and they're going to be bought out with an insurance company or they're going to fail and they're going to end up in the PPF. And um, the Honourable Lady was absolutely right that uh, deficits have been pushed up by uh, low guilt yields and low interest rates. Um, and that a lot of uh, employers uh, are pushed by their trustees and by a certain extent by the regulator have very prudent assumptions in their valuation setting, which increases the amount they have to, to pay in. And in some ways that can be a bit of a false picture of the deficit, but it also does match effectively the reality of trying to, to, to buy on the market. So there is flexibility within the system, and I think one of the things that the regulator is looking at is, is to be more akin to employer affordability within the valuation assumption setting, which should uh, help with some of these things. And I think fundamentally what this drives to is a system which is completely linked to the employer covenant. The stronger your employer is, the more flexibility you have. That gives you much more leverage to, to play around with your assumptions. If you're a very weak employer, that means you can't afford to take as much risk, so you're much tighter with your assumptions. So it pushes the deficit up, it then pushes the amount of money that has to be paid in uh, to a higher level. So it's kind of this self-perpetuating cycle where the weakest schemes who need the biggest support 
don't get it. They're the schemes that need the breathing space but have to pay very high levels mm -hmm. of deficit repair contributions. And when, I think as my, my honourable friend mentioned earlier, when you're considering a lot of these are legacy schemes, predominantly in old school manufacturing industries, a lot of the companies are, are shells of what they were in the yeah. 70s and 80s when these were, were, were brought in. And uh, they, the employers already provide weak covenants and um, that, that situation may, may well only get worse as we, we move forward. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the fact that the PPF Purple Book estimates that there are 3 million DB members who only have a 50% chance of seeing their benefits paid in full um, is, is quite remarkable. And I think the PPF is a fantastic lifeboat scheme. It's absolutely fantastic that we have that here in this country to ensure that people will still get decent payment of pensions, but we don't really want people to be relying upon it. Um, I do disagree with the, the Honourable Lady in terms of consolidation. I do think what the government has been looking to do there is very sensible. Um, I think that lack of scale is, is really quite crucial. Um, Two-thirds of the UK's defined benefit schemes have less than 1,000 members, and small schemes can't access the sorts of sophisticated uh, investment opportunities um, as bigger schemes. And even actually just the cost of advisory fees, accountancy fees, actuarial fees, legal fees, uh, are just disproportionately high for, for small schemes. So I do think there really is a good place for consolidation, but I think she is right to be worried about governance and that you don't go from a situation where you have very high levels of governance under an employer scheme into a bigger wide scheme where you just kind of get lost. But I think that's probably something that you can actually be worked through in terms of the design and setup of, of, of the scheme. Um, ultimately, the solution to, to protecting DB schemes is, is, for me, not governmental, but in the economy and in the strength of the sponsor or where available. Um, the parent company. Um, and one of the big difficulties is just the volatility and the lack of certainty around, around the risk. Um, so I do think the government has and it continues to take steps to, to pick apart the issues that the DB sector is facing and is doing a lot of good work. Um, but I think fundamentally what we, we do need as we go forward is a clear understanding that governance, funding and, government, uh, and covenants sorry, are intrinsically linked. And I very much look forward to hearing the good story that the Minister has got to tell on what the government is doing later on.